everybody, Formula 2 returned to the home of motorsport this weekend, a classic track and it certainly delivered some classic racing. This is the F2 show by Inside F2, I'm your host Fraser Ford and joining me to review all of the action from nine round of the season we have Inside F2 writers Lawrence Griffin and Aaron Harper. Coming up on the show then, despite a five second time penalty, Victor Martins became the 43rd winner of a Formula 2 race. We reflect on his performance. We discuss some of the main incidents and talking points from this weekend. And which drivers are ready for Formula 1? We get our panel's thoughts. Let's get into it then guys, British Grand Prix weekend. And I know that we face being labelled with uh, British bias for this one, but uh, best race of the year, isn't it Aaron? Oh, unapolog- unapologetically so. Silverstone delivered, didn't it? Whether it was Formula 3, Formula 1 or good old Formula 2, it was just fantastic, wasn't it? And it the, what I put it down to is the sequence of corners. And you, you've got the opening few corners, like from the start, they can battle there. And then there's a straight and a big breaking zone into Brooklands where they can end up side by side through Luffield. And then contrary to uh, common belief, you can overtake through Cops and then they get to do it all again into Stowe and Vale and Club. It's just, it's just brilliant. Unbelievable, isn't it? Lawrence, glad to be back at the British Grand Prix. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a, it was a wonderful weekend. Made all the better by some classic British weather as well, spicing it up nicely in the in the sprint race and and in qualifying. We we'll just, it just made it a lot more exciting than it would have been otherwise. Which you know, with the out, outlay of the of the circuit, as Aaron said, would have being good anyway so it was nice to see you can tell it's a good track when you get racing good racing across all three categories f3 f2 and f1 and that's what that's what silverstone delivered absolutely and i don't know whether our listeners uh, watched the uh, the formula free sprint race on saturday but the weather certainly spiced that one up that was a, a great race in itself uh, but yeah back to the formula two action uh, victor martins became our newest winner of a formula two race Probably pretty overdue, I'd say, that one is, isn't it? And, but he, uh, he finally put it all together, didn't he, Lawrence? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And it's been it's been such a long time coming. I think it's a bit of a shock when you think of Victor Martins' performance all throughout this season. The idea that we're only talking about him now as a, as a race winner is, is almost unbelievable. I mean, he was second, his qualifying performances this is, Second in Bahrain, pole in Saudi, third in Australia. He had one blip in Baku, second in Monaco, seventh in Barcelona, wasn't as strong. Then he's got pole in Austria and in Silverstone. And so that's around third place on average, which is just incredible. I mean, this is a driver in his rookie season. Granted, he is, you know, I think he's slightly older than Teo Pocher. He has more experience. He was in Formula 3 for longer. But, you know, this is still his first year in Formula 2 for him to be performing that consistently well in quali when you only have you know about five minutes worth of practice before you have to go qualifying and especially when you have changeable conditions like this weekend that ability to deliver weekend in weekend out is amazing so that really then explains why it feels so weird that this is his first win but I think now that he's got that and partially because of how the season's gone that he's not really in contention for the title I think it sort of lifts the pressure off him a little bit. He's proved what he can do, but he, he's not under any massive pressure to go on and, and challenge Teo chair for the for the title this season. So I think you'll see now that that will sort of open the floodgates for him and he can start to drive with a bit more confidence and try to make this weekend, following up that qualifying performance with a good race performance, make that a bit more of a, of a regular occurrence, I think. Yeah, he, he was very aggressive with Ayumu Oasa at the start of the, the feature race. He then slammed the door on Oddie Behrman. Um, is this the start of a new, more aggressive uh, Victor Martins, Aaron? Uh, was, uh, yeah, what were your thoughts on, on, on the start of the feature race? Uh, I think he's shown that sort of aggression before. I think if we remember rightly back to Monaco, he was uh, aggressive with uh, Paul Cher at the start, wasn't he? Trying to cover him off. So it's not um, it's not something we haven't seen before, but... You know, you're going for your first win at Silverstone. It's a very historic circuit. It means quite a lot to win there. So you want to do everything in your power to legally uh, keep people behind. And I, I don't really know if he gained an advantage by being all four wheels off the circuit. It's classic opening lap stuff, really, isn't it? But the stewards felt otherwise, and they didn't penalise some, some at Stowe. So 
I mean, go figure. His performance thereafter was just superb. And he, he, he delivered, he, he did the aggressive stuff and then he showed that he had the raw speed and he's been, he's been threatening this sort of performance all season, really, hasn't he? He took pole in Jeddah, he's taken pole in Austria and, and in Silverstone. So there's, the one lap speed has been undeniable, but putting it together in a race, it's the first time it's properly come together for him and what circumstances to do it in as well, like overcoming a five-second time penalty. Um, I don't think Zane Maloney was near, well, he clearly wasn't anywhere near quick enough had it been Porsche behind him or perhaps uh, Vesti or Behrman in the Premers, might have been a different story. But he took the situation that he had and he went and pulled that five seconds. And, and you know, that aggressive move at the start paid off because if he'd been bunched up behind other cars, might not have happened. Was that a Zayn Maloney thing or was that a Carlin thing? Is that ART just that much quicker than what a Carlin is? And uh, Zayn Maloney couldn't quite get near him. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, Aaron? Probably a little bit of both. I think Zayn is still bedding into Formula 2 a little bit. Um, it was a good performance for him. So, mm, really good. yeah, a little bit of both. Carlin haven't been as strong as they were last year. Premer mm. have made a step forward and, and ART have remained pretty strong. But don't count Carlin out. They've got two handy drivers who can win a race on the right day. So never say never with, it, with those two. That was absolutely, absolutely the right way for Martins to respond to that, to that, um, to that penalty. Reminds me a little bit of, I think it was Daniel Ricciardo a few years back in, in Russia when he got the penalty and went, okay, then I'll just drive, I'll just drive faster now. And he didn't actually, he wasn't actually directly told that he had a five second time penalty. His team just came over the radio and went, okay, keep pushing, build a gap, try, aim to build a five second gap to the car behind. And he went, five seconds, have I got a penalty? And they said, well, yes, but you can build the gap anyway, so don't worry about it. And, and you know, sure enough, he went, he, he went and did that, but yeah, what an awkward penalty. Yeah, because I think, I mean, he said after the race, and I, I probably tend to agree, it was just hard racing. They were both pushing each other around. He was sort of ran out of space. He might have gained a slight advantage from that, but when you, you, you know, take into account that it's the opening lap, you think you allow a little bit of leeway. Um, but, you know, it's not for, for any people listening, thinking what is motorsport doing with track limits? It's not just us. You know, you look at football and their struggles with offside. Always in, in sport, you're going to have some fine margins and how you sort of officiate those is always going to, you know, throw up some some pretty bad decisions from from now and then. So I think we're not doing too bad, really, comparatively, I wouldn't have said. We're not. I definitely don't want VAR in uh, motorsport. Absolutely not after uh, seeing that. Um, I, I do think I agree with it. It's very harsh, I have to say. It is very harsh, but I do think I agree with it in that if they're going to penalise drivers for track limits in, in, in Spielberg, for example, as harshly as they did, I think they've obviously got to do the same at Silverstone. Uh, Victor Master did go full four wheels off of the track and he did complete the, or did start the overtake uh, where uh, he overtook Owasa, obviously. So I do think I do agree with the penalty. It's harsh, but I do agree with it. My my problem is, is that Aaron, as you say, there was definitely some drivers who were going off at Stowe, all four, four wheels off the, off the track um, and weren't necessarily penalised for that uh, like they perhaps should have been. And it's that lack of consistency that is sometimes frustrating for fans, isn't it, Aaron? Yeah, before, before I answer that, we should mention that we you mean video assistant referee, not Van Amersport Racing. You don't want yes, in motorsport. Definitely. Just to clarify that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is the inconsistency from corner to corner and race to race. Well, we saw it in Formula One, and that ended up in the, the two cars that were involved actually colliding later on. It is, it is disappointing to see that, but I suppose as long as it's consistent at each each corner so at Stowe if they're penalizing one but they're not another that's where it's really frustrating but they just let everything go all right well just it's a free-for-all I mean take advantage of it as much as you want think back to the, the 2021 Bahrain Grand Prix where drivers were running wide at turn four and they kind of changed the rule halfway through but I think someone put a video together with Hamilton going over there like 30 odd times so you know, as long as it's consistent one way or the other, then that's fine. It's when they start muddying the waters, it's 
it's most frustrating. Track limits. We're always going to be talking about them. I expect uh, five years' time, we'll still be talking about track limits uh, and uh, right and wrong. So let's move on from that. Um, up and down weekend for our championship leader, Frederick Vesti, uh, dominated the sprint race, won by 13 seconds, uh, but then DNF'd in the, in the feature race, didn't he, Lawrence? Yeah, I mean, it was it was unfortunate for him. I think uh, a sprint race win and DNF in the feature isn't a fair isn't a fair ref- the reflection of his weekend. You know, you would have hoped to have had a better qualifying performance than than uh, was it P was it P eight P nine P ten something, something P10, like that P ten P ten um and so you know that that is a little bit disappointing for him. But it was an unbelievable drive in the in the sprint race. He looked really in control. Um, you know, to deal with those sorts of conditions. And yeah, what an unfortunate incident to crash out with a safety car restart. I mean, totally not his fault, just the concertina effect um, going to the last few corners. Uh, I think it was Dennis Halgo who, who ran up behind him and just and just clattered him. And, he, you know, he, he couldn't do anything about that in, that in that situation. So I think a tough weekend for him, but he comes out of it still with a six point lead. I mean, you know, Teo Pocha is in, within striking distance now of him, but he's had, he's had two weekends now. He was caught out by the safety car in Austria as well. There are two weekends where he's been a bit unfortunate, but hopefully he can just sort of take those on the chin and realize that his actual own performances are still pretty good. Um, you know, and if he comes out and wins in Hungary and he extends that gap again, then no worries. But then all of a sudden, if Porcher goes and wins in Hungary and he starts to and he, you know, he draws level or or goes ahead of him, then all of a sudden it looks like you're starting to get this slide in performance from Vesti, and that's when he might start to get a bit nervous about the about the championship. Um so I think how he looks back on this weekend really will depend on on what's to come. You know, if he if he wins the next two rounds, he won't he won't care one bit. Yeah, definitely. It's a bit of a, an unfortunate incident, wasn't it, for, for Frederick Vesti? I do actually want to clarify that, Aaron. I don't know if you were about to say the same thing, but I believe it was actually Roy Nassani who hit the back of Dennis Hauger, who then hit Frederick Vesti, who then hit Roman Stanek. And the only reason, I, and, and Lawrence, I understand why you're saying Dennis Hauger, because on TV, it definitely looked like it was Dennis Hauger, right? We didn't actually see the footage, but it's that Roy Nassani was summoned to the stewards, um, given a 10 second penalty for causing the incident, Aaron. I don't know whether you saw that, uh, but it sounds like it was actually Roy Nassani that uh, yeah, started that, uh, that incident. Yeah, I did see that Nassani had been penalised, and uh, another driver we'll talk about later on was another driver, was another driver penalised as well. Um, I mean, <laughs> It's one of those things behind the safety car. It's it's a big braking zone into Vale. Yes, he's made a mistake, but it's just one of those things that happens behind the safety car. A penalty is absolutely justified, but we move on from it. Such a domino effect, wasn't it? It was such bad luck for, for everyone involved because it yeah. ruined their restart. Yeah, it did. Nissani oh. and, and Hauger are on that exact same bit of track again. Yeah. Same as same as last year. It was Nissani and Hauger, wasn't it, coming together? Ill, Ill omens for both of them. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen that footage, actually, the onboard from Nasani. I don't know why they didn't show it, but, um, you know, it, everyone was under the impression that it was Dennis Hauger that hit the back of Frederick Vesti. But, um, yeah, obviously it was Roy Nasani by the sounds of it. And, uh, yeah, if that footage is out there, I'd love to see it because uh, we didn't really get a full, full picture of what happened there. Unfortunate for Vesti, but as you say, Lawrence, I'm sure... He will bounce back and he is still in the championship lead uh, off the back of round nine with uh, five to go. So I'm sure he'll be happy about that. Uh, The person very close to uh, stealing that lead off of him, Teo Porsche, double podium for him. He closes the gap to to six points to Frederick Vesti. Now, guys, I want to... Now, I saw a tweet over the weekend and I was like, this is a great tweet for the podcast to, to get stuck into and discuss. So Dan on Twitter says... Teo Porsche should be in Formula 1. He only he, He's only qualified outside the top three twice, uh, once being P5 and once being P8. He's also been super consistent in feature races, getting podiums in every race other than Spain and Austria, where he got unlucky with strategy, and in Jeddah, where yeah he made, he made an error. Although Guan Yu Zhou has been okay in Formula 1, Teo Porsche has the far superior junior career 
and has far superior potential too. Uh, your thoughts on that, boys? Uh, Lawrence, I can see uh, you're pulling a bit of a face at that one. Uh, is First of all, is Terry Porsche ready for Formula One? And two, is he the most ready on the Formula Two grid, Lawrence, in your opinion? Is, is he ready? Yeah, definitely he's ready. He's, he's had, I think he's had enough time in Formula 2 and I think he's built up that experience. I think he's he's definitely ready to go into an F1 seat. bit harsh on Guan Yu Zhou there. Very, very harsh on him. A very respectable junior career. You know, a, again, a driver that took a couple of years to get to their best. But, you know, he, he did battle with Oscar Piastri, who you know is is one of the finest, he's had one of the finest junior careers we've ever we've ever seen, and you know Oscar ended up getting that title, and 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 Grand Yujo did look slightly second best to him, but I think there's no there's no shame in that for sure. Um, but no, he does he does look ready, I think, and he does look the most ready of the of the drivers out there. I think. You know, you might look at someone like a like a Fred Vesti potentially, or or a Victor Martins as both being sort of quite steady, um, consistent, mature drivers. Um, but Martins, as we've said, doesn't quite have the full, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle together yet. Um, Vesti in his in his second season does look like a complete driver. I think you know go figure we're talking about the two top drivers in the championship as being the two most ready for f1 there's a there's a reason that f2 gets you ready for f1 um but yeah no, i think i think terpa chair is ready obviously what we know is it depends on the musical chairs that takes place in in formula one um and you know all the while remembering that there are people like felipe drogovic still in the picture you know he hasn't gone anywhere he's a part of that aston martin junior team but we've seen how you know, contracts can be ripped up and people can move all over the place. So it is so hard to predict. But what you would say is that, okay, Guan Yu Zhou hasn't been setting the world alight whilst at Alpha. I think he's been putting in some very respectable performances, especially in relation to Bottas, who's got so much experience. There's a potential that Bottas won't be there for too much longer. I'd, I'd say the team probably want his experience and he seems quite quite happy there and he seems to be doing quite well. So it really depends on what happens. But if that opportunity comes up, I think he's he's ready for it, for sure. Yeah, you'd have to say Teo is ready. But like you say, Lawrence, there's such a a busy sort of set of seats at the moment in, in Formula One. Everyone's kind of locked in. And you're seeing this with like Charles Leclerc. Where does he go if he wants to leave Ferrari? Because, you know, the, is he going to win a world championship there? And to just get into Formula One is so difficult, hence the need for more teams and all the problems that that's causing. I personally would love to see teams run three cars and you then just have a 30-car grid. For the elite level, fine. More action, more cars on track. Then you get your poor shares, you get Vesti, you get Drogovic, maybe you get a few drivers coming over from IndyCar. It makes it a bit easier. I know this is a topic for a different day, hypothetically, if there was three car teams, Porsche would already be in Formula One. So I think that sort of tells you everything you need to know. If there was a space, he would be there. Unfortunately, there just isn't space at the moment. And Alfa Romeo, Sauber, he's kind of locked out at the moment through the contracts. And like you say, Lawrence, they'll want Bottas's experience. And if they were going to put Porsche in, Porsche would need Bottas's experience as well. Joe hasn't done a bad job. He's been very respectable against Bottas, who's a, a multi-race winner in Formula One. Do you think Theo Porsche could go in and do immediately a better job than Joe Guan Yu? That's, a, that's possibly the question we need to ask ourselves, not whether the Porsche is ready. We know he's ready. Here's the question then, Aaron. Uh, 2024, uh, Alfred, well, Sauber, whatever they're going to be called, whatever they're going to be called, um, Bot what's the stronger lineup? Bottas and Joe or Bottas and Porsche? Bottas has his critics critics, so I'm tempted to go Joe Porsche. And obviously that experience is really important. And when Audi turn up, they might still want him around for that experience. So it only leaves one seat. Joe has not done a bad job at all, but I think Porsche is that good. Um but yeah, I'd probably go with Bottas and Porsche as a slightly stronger pairing. Fair enough. It's, it's an interesting one. Uh, obviously, uh, Mercedes, we've got Mick Schumacher to think about as well, I guess, with Frederick Vesti. Uh, Lawrence, just before we move on, uh, Bottas, Porsche, uh, Potta, Bottas, Joe, uh, Joe, 
what's uh, what what's, what would you go for? I don't know. You could have you could have anything, couldn't you? You could have you could have Porsche Bottas, and then you could have you could have you know Joe Danny Rick at Alpha Tauri for all for all we know. You know, it's it's so it's so hard to so hard to tell. I just think that there's there's something a little bit special about Teo Porcher, the level of talent he's got, the the you know winning around Monaco as a 17 year old is is very impressive. Um, I think what people will see in Porsche, you know, as young as he is, is real potential that if you get him in to F1 and maybe don't put him into a high pressure seat, you know, talk about Vesti going into Mercedes, potentially that's, you know, that's unbelievable pressure, but to give him a few years to build his confidence and then get into a, a car that can that can fight for wins, you know. I th- he he is someone that I think will be earmarked as a as a star of the future in F one. I'm not quite sure that people would consider Joe in quite the same light potentially. Um, but you know, that's no disrespect to Guan Yu Joe whatsoever. He's, he's an absolutely brilliant driver as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Porsche obviously uh, running Oscar Piastri very close in the in the Formula Three Championship, uh, and we know how well Oscar Piastri has done this weekend. Shout out to him, P four, probably robbed of a podium uh, by a safety car. So yeah, fair play to him. Um, I think for me, uh, I think Bottas Porsche is probably the best lineup for twenty twenty four, and that's no disrespect to Guan Yu Zhou. I think I'm with you guys. I think Bottas obviously gave Hamilton a good run for his money. We know how good Lewis Hamilton is. Uh, I think Bottas is a very good driver, and I think Teo Porsche really is that you know that good, and he does have a lot of potential, as you guys say. Um, I personally think Guan Yu Zhou will end up. Uh, yeah, at Haas. I reckon he'll end up at Alfa Romeo Haas. Uh, he'll take his money over there. They don't want to go for a rookie. Uh, and uh, he brings a bit of experience as well as uh, some good race pace over to, to Alfa Romeo Haas uh, alongside Nico Hulkenberg. Anyway, we have really gone off topic there, haven't we? Back to the Formula 2. Um Another driver with uh, perhaps a bit of F1 potential, Wally Behrman. Um, yeah, I feel I feel like we probably saw the the, the best and the worst of Wally Behrman this weekend, and uh, some amazing overtakes, some great overtakes. With Taron, I know you want to want to talk about maybe uh, a little bit harsh defending on Jack Doohan. I don't think Jack Doohan was overly happy with with that defending, and then obviously hit Kushmani in the uh, in in the feature race as well and got demoted. A couple of places. Yeah, is, is that fair to say, Aaron, that um, yeah, we probably saw the best and the worst of Oli Berman this weekend? I wouldn't phrase it as the best and the worst. I would phrase it as how good Behrman can be and what he still has to learn. Because that's what Formula 2 is. It, we've spoken about, is Porsche ready for Formula 1? Formula 2 is a finishing school for Formula 1. You don't want to put, and Red Bull have found this out, you don't want to put a driver in from Formula 2 too quickly because they struggle. Yuki Tsunoda is a prime, a prime example, did great things in Formula 2, needed that second season, really did. Oli Behrman will get that second season, hopefully with Prima, um, and he's in the Ferrari Driver Academy, so odds are he'll probably stay there. And I thought we saw some exceptionally talented driving from Oli Behrman, especially in the wet. I think it was Enzo Fittipaldi, he put that move on into Maggots in the wet. It's Unbelievable move. Classically good, isn't it? The last person I saw do that is the current reigning Formula One world champion. So that tells you the level that you're dealing with there. Someone who's got uh, the bravery to, to do that in the wet and the confidence to pull it off. And yes, it did get a bit scrappy, but I'd rather see Behrman fight and push the boundaries a bit too much and, and get a bit of a telling off for it in the first season. I think you can allow that. If it was his second season, I'd be going, OK, maybe... You need to sort of wise up a bit. But remember, he's only like 18, 19, 18 years old. So he's far from the finished article. I mean, Teo Porsche, we've just been discussing, he's not 20 until the middle of next month. So this is the sort of age bracket you're dealing with. And how good they are, even at this age, is just unbelievable to me. But yes, we did see some mistakes that the lockup when battling Doohan in the sprint race, the uh, the going wide at the restart in the feature race. And, you know, there's still things that Ollie needs to learn, but he's working on them. And we've seen just how good he could be. He's won three races already this season. As a, as a spectator, you wouldn't want it any other way, would you? 
you know, you could you could go one or two ways. You could start off very conservative and build up and build up, or you could just go for it and find the limit and find the limit by shooting right past it, like he shot right past Jack Doohan in the breaking zone, and then you know, then rein it back from that. Um, but I think I don't know. Also, potentially psychologically with the other drivers, showing that you've got that, that you know they know when they look and see Ollie Behrman in the mirrors that if they don't cover the apex, that he'll be there. You know, we don't know what speed he'll be going when he gets there, but he'll be there. And, you know, that, I think, I think that is a good thing to have when you're going into wheel, wheel battle. And yeah. And, you know, we, we, I make it out like he's, you know, just going for crazy moves all the time. He's not the, the aggression that he shows is, is really quite measured the vast majority of the time. And it's borne out by, by the results for him, by him being that high up in the, in the championship. We saw, in in Austria, when his his teammate, the championship leader, was behind him, couldn't follow him through the through the traffic that he was getting through. So he has got unbelievable ability. He can put it on pole round Baku with bent steering. Um, so yeah, ex- really excited to see what else Oli Behrman does this season. Yeah, some unbelievable moves, moves that got me uh, on the edge of my seat uh, there this weekend. I was really excited to, uh, yeah, it's good good to see a driver that young pulling off moves like that. I think it's super exciting for the sport. Um, and yeah, I think we will see him in Formula One one day. Lawrence, just quick one, should, should he have been penalised for um, his battle with Jack Doohan? Obviously, Jack Doohan certainly thinks he should have been. Um, yeah, what were, your, what were your thoughts on that? I don't think so. If they'd come together, then probably yes. The fact that Doohan managed to avoid it probably changes the situation slightly. Again, it's but should a, that mean he doesn't get penalised for that, right? Because if uh, if Jack Doohan doesn't avoid the, those those incidents and and there's an accident, yeah, I just think it's a bit harsh that a driver has to uh, you know pull out of a move and they have to make contact for it to then be mm. deemed as unacceptable, right? Yeah, no. It, on on the face of it, yeah, that 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 that's absolutely right. Um, it's just we've seen it in so many other incidents. The driver moves, there's no crash and there's no penalty. The driver doesn't move and there's a crash, and then and you know you then that was game over. And what what you saw in 2021 between Hamilton and Verstappen was two yeah. drivers who were never going to move, and that just kept on happening. Um, so it's, it's a really tough one, I think. I don't know if you can maybe chalk up a point on the license for that so that if you're constantly dive bombing people, they're avoiding it, that that is going to have some sort of ramifications without, you know, you immediately having a penalty for it. Um, Yeah, because sometimes it's just a misjudgment as well, slightly on on the brakes. It's not about being dangerous or out of control. So it's a it's a really, really tricky one. Um, You know, we know we know what what Dewan thought of it with his uh, with his quite sort of nonchalant little wave as he as he drove past you know putting the power down on the apex of a of a corner in a formula 2 car i don't know how quite you're able to do that but it was it was fun to see the the wave certainly was something. I never quite seen anything like that in Formula <laughs> Two before. Um, yeah, Aaron, I want to talk about Jack Doohan. He actually hasn't qualified outside the top five since Baku, which uh, is unbelievable. Second highest average qualifying uh, behind Victor Martins since then. And uh, he said he would have been on pole if it wasn't for Jam Correa uh, spinning in front of him uh, in in qualifying. He uh, yeah says he's in a good window and uh, he's he's doing pretty well. He just doesn't quite have the points to to to, to back his, his good qualifying performance, his good pace, does he? Yeah, it's just not quite coming together for him, is it? When he's had the pace, it's not worked out. And when he hasn't had the pace, it's really not worked out. It's It's gone completely down the pan for him. So, I mean, he got, he got the podium at last uh, in the sprint race. He always goes well around Silverstone. He showed that last year in the wet conditions. Um, if he'd been able to dispatch of Behrman a bit quicker, he might have challenged uh, Porsche and maybe, well, probably not Vesti because he was completely in control in the sprint, wasn't he? Um, maybe put, challenged Porsche for second. And then his, his uh, feature race was pretty solid. So hopefully it's a return to the Jack Doohan of last year. It's uh, a fourth, a third and a fourth again in the last three races. So uh, hopefully he's back at the sharp end for good. And you quite, like you say, the qualifying performances have been there. Now it's about converting that into serious points. And when I say serious points, I mean in a feature race. He's got to be winning or being on the podium in those feature races to be 
he's not going to be a factor in the championship in terms of winning it, but he could be a real factor in deciding where it goes and who, who manages to stay ahead of him or uh, stays closest to him, perhaps, if he's winning. And, and also, we're, we're coming up to a, a part of the calendar where, where Jack Dewan's done well before. Just remember the weekend he had at Spa last yeah. year. Um, so, you know, if he if he repeats that performance, you know, gets himself, you know, 25 points and the rest further up, then all of a sudden he's not he's not looking too bad by any stretch. And it'll be a, several feature races with with some good podiums. So if he can find that form again, that'll be really nice to see because Aaron's absolutely right. He looks like he's built confidence now and he's getting back to being consistently where he roughly should be. Um, but to make up for the slow start in the season, he really wants to be getting those wins um, and he, he'll just be desperate for that to, to finally come together. So maybe maybe Spa will be the place, who knows? Absolutely. He's still uh, top 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 five in the championship, still on, I'm guessing. I'm just looking at the standings now. He's uh, 16 points off of fourth, mm. which uh, doesn't seem very far away at all, does it? So um, yeah, top five in the championship, still on for Jack Dewan Lawrence? Yeah, I'm absolutely, absolutely still on. Um, because if you, especially if you look at it as the the sort of the trend of improvement that he's had so far, if he keeps up with that, then yeah, he can he can definitely catch up with with some of those drivers ahead. But that yeah. that being said, the likes of you know you're looking like him catching people like Martins, Behrman, Iwasa, you know these aren't drivers who I expect to slip up massively either. So it's going to be tough. But I think I think like like Aaron said. He could play a real role in, you know, getting involved and fighting with drivers whilst they're trying to, you know, win the title in peace and they're having a good weekend. But then there's Jack Dewan, you know, racing them hard all the way. So that'll be that'll be great to see. Absolutely demonstrates the uh, yeah, how seriously competitive the Formula Two field is this season. And uh, yeah, I tweeted about it on uh, on on Friday after qualifying at underscore Phrasefield One. If you don't follow me already, uh, yes, I'm going to plug my own social media. Um, the 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 whole field were um, oh well, sorry, the whole field, the top eight were separated by less than two tenths of a second, which is unbelievably competitive when you think about it. All the way from Victor Martins in pole all the way down to Teo Porsche in eighth was separated, yeah, by one point, uh, sorry, 0. 0.187 of a second, which is uh, on, on a track like Silverstone as well. Yeah. I, you know, that, it's not like it was Austria, you know, such a long and complex lap. Yeah, it really does show the quality of the of the field, doesn't it? Yeah, maybe maybe Formula One should uh, take note of that. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's wrap it up there, guys. Let's take a look at the championship standings before we go. Teo Porsche has cut the gap at the top of the driver standings to just six points between him and Frederick Vesti. Ayumu Awaso within a wet race win of the pair as well. It's game on at the top. Victor Martins, he moves level on points with Oli Behrman after his feature race victory, 88 points between the pair of them. A third podium of the season for Zane Maloney, he moves up to P9 and Dennis Hauger rounds out the top 10. And the team standings, six points between Porsche and Vesti, also six points between ART and Prima as well. The French outfit move ever closer to the Italian team at the top. Carlin sit P4 despite not having won a race all season. They'll be hoping that changes over the next couple of rounds. Campos, they remain 7th, uh, but they're uh, coming under pressure from Virtuosi. No points since Monaco for Campos. PHM remain pointless at the foot of the standings. They ran out in top 11. Okay, that's all we've got time for today. My thanks to Lawrence and to Aaron for joining us on today's show. If you've enjoyed the show, as always, make sure you give it a like, subscribe for more Formula 2 content, and as always, get involved in the conversation on our social media channels. We love hearing your thoughts and opinions. But from me, Fraser Ford, and all of us here at Inside F2, how does it go, Jack Doohan? See ya!